Hello, I've been practicing this uh, because it is a lovely Tuesday, Physical Sciences with Tracy. Guys, my name is Abram and welcome to the show where we learn more and learn extra. Did you hear that, Tracy? I did. Can you talk any faster? Hello. Hello, you seem to be in a bit of a rush today. No, 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 I'm just practicing how you speak. Me? I don't speak this that This is how fast. you speak. Hello. No, I don't. You do. Hi, Tracy. I think he's been rude. Sorry. Hello, so, Tracy. Hello. Yes, there you we are go again. Right. You know what? <laughs> I think I should leave now because apparently he's got me down <laughs> flat and I can just go. I'm anyway. sorry. How are you yes, doing today? Fine and You're you. looking good, I must say. Oh, thank you. Those earrings. Thank you. I had my mom, you know, to show off. Yeah. Moving on, moving on. Of course, what and are we doing? Well, <laughs> we're going to be civilised. That's when my grade 11's watching. Um, we're going to do applications of chemical equilibrium. Last week, I think you did KC, you did calculations. So today, we're going to look at applications, and we're going to see what happens when we change things, and mm -hmm. how we can move equilibrium around. That's said to be a fine it's show. It's actually very cool. This very is the cool. easy marks in this child. With, with equilibrium, KC can be a little difficult, so sometimes you don't look at the calculations, but this one you can get. This is Collect free marks. Absolutely. Right, guys, to learn more and learn extra with us, get yourself the notes I've already posted for you. Go to our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash learn extra, X-T-R-A, no E. And also follow us on uh, Twitter at learn extra. Remember, guys, this is one of Tracy's baby, so mm -hmm. make sure that you get this workbook for only 139 Rand. All you need to do is to send an email at sales, um, to sales at mindset.co.za. Tracy? Oh, can you tell we don't have auto cues at what end? Yeah, I'm also like that. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, I'm not really sure why I have the calculator open since we're doing no calculations today that I can remember. Anyway, so what are we actually going to look at? Well, we're going to look at Le Chatelier's principle. We're going to consider changes in equilibrium. And then along the way, with doing examples, we're going to look at graphs, okay? Now, these are different to your rate graphs, and you have to look very carefully at them as to what information they're giving you. But first, we have to do the challenge question. So, what is the name? the full name of this scientist who was awarded the title of Grand Officier in May 1927. Okay, so that's my, my, and there's a picture of him. Okay, and you can see, I will give you a clue, he is a Frenchman. What is the full name, surname only, not allowed, of this scientist who was awarded the title of a Grand Officier, I should not do a French accent, in May 1927. Have we got that? Yeah. So, all right, so we're going to leave that there for you. I've got some interesting stories to tell you. So, let's do Le Chatelier's Principle. Guys, please learn Le Chatelier's Principle. One, because you can be asked to state it, which is always like any of your definitions, you can be asked to state it, but Often, in your explanations, they are going to say to you, use Le Chatelier's principle too. And then they actually want you to state his principle, okay? Which says, if the conditions of an equilibrium system, okay, equilibrium system are changed by changing temperature, pressure, or concentration, a process takes place which tends to oppose the effect of the change. What this principle is saying to us is, if we've reached equilibrium, so we have a spontaneously reversible reaction, that if we put it in a closed system, so nothing can leave the system, doesn't mean it necessarily has to be in a closed jar or a closed um, test tube, but a closed system simply means that nothing can escape from, from it. So you're not creating, um, if it's, say, an open test tube, you're not creating a gas that then can escape, okay? But it's a system where everything, the mass of the system will remain constant. Once it's reached equilibrium, in other words, the forward and the reverse rates are equal, and now we change something in that system. So we change the temperature of it, we add some more stuff to it, we take something away, we change the pressure, that system will adjust for that change, okay? And the way I like to describe it, and, and I'm hoping some of my mama tricks are watching because I think I'm a little sexist towards, like I'm quite mean to the boys, but I'm going to me be mean to the girls, so it is a little sexist, okay? Equilibrium is like a teenage girl. Just cannot make up its mind. And is never happy, okay? So you know what it's like when... 
for example, you have a teenage girl and she knows that the very cute boy who sits two desks away from her likes her. She's all snooty <laughs> and ignores him. And eventually he decides, no, I'm, I'm done. I'm over this. And then what happens? No, no, I like you. Come back, <laughs> come back. Because she's never happy. And then when he likes her, she goes, no, don't. That's equilibrium, okay? So when we change the conditions, it wants to do the opposite. So whatever you do to it, the system will do the exact opposite because it can. So the things we can use to change equilibrium, temperature, concentration, and pressure. Temperature is the nicest one to actually remember because temperature affects it regardless of whether you've got gases, solids, liquids, etc. Temperature... And what you, please, it's really important here that when we do these examples, that you don't learn that if I increase temperature, it's always going to favor the forward reaction, always going to favor the reverse or make more product or whatever. Don't learn it like that, okay? Learn what the, re what the re reaction does. Now, if we increase the temperature, so I increase temperature, that's like on a hot summer's day. It gets hot, hot, hot. Not that winter in Joburg at the moment is cold, but let's just go with it. So it gets really hot. What do we do? The first thing we do is when we get into a room, we put the aircon on. I'm very lucky in that I have an aircon in my classroom because I have a prefab, right, and it gets stinking hot in winter. Uh, no, gee, in summer. Sure. <laughs> it's been a very long day, just so you know. Can you imagine what it was like teaching? Anyway, so it gets really, really hot in my classroom, which is why I was given the aircon. And the first thing a child does is come into my classroom and say, put the aircon on, because they want it cold. So when I increase temperature, the equilibrium must shift to get rid of that heat, which means it's going to go towards the endothermic reaction, whatever way that is, okay, whichever way gets heat taken away. If we decrease the temperature, this is like now it's winter, all right, and now the complete opposite happens in my classroom because it's winter. Not that it's been that cold. I think we've been quite lucky, actually. It's a bit cold in the mornings and evenings, but, man, it's been hot during the day. So, and I've got a prefab, so my classroom's quite warm. So now it's cold. First thing they do when they walk into my classroom, have you put the heater on? I'm like, really? Can't satisfy you, but they are teenagers after all. Not much I can do. So... What it does, if, if I decrease the temperature, the equilibrium is going to want to shift to this place which creates heat, which is the exothermic reaction. So it favors the exothermic reaction. How do I know which reaction is which? By delta H. Remember, when we write the equation and I tell you delta H is less than zero, that's for the forward reaction. If the forward reaction is exothermic, then the reverse reaction is endothermic. Okay, you can't have both being the same. So one reaction is always exothermic, one is always endothermic. Delta H always refers to the forward reaction without exception. Okay, the next thing we can change is concentration. Now, okay, come, there we go. Concentration only applies to gases and solutions. Please be careful here because... They're going to try and trick you out and change the amount of a solid. That doesn't change concentration, okay? A solid can't have a concentration because it's a solid. Concentration is the number of particles per volume solvent. A solid isn't dissolved in anything. But gases and solutions absolutely have concentrations, okay? So we can change the concentration. And this is just as easy. If we increase the concentration of something, the, sit, the equilibrium needs to use it up. So if I add more of something, it's going to favor the reaction that's going to use it. It's going to take it away. So if I add reactant, I'm gonna, the reaction will favor making lots and lots of product. Okay? If I add product, then it's going to favor making reactant. If I take it away then it's going to want to make it. So if I take products away, it's like what we do in the harbor process, is we dissolve the ammonia that's made. That takes the product away, so the reactants react more to make more product. Okay? If I should take reactants away, then I'll 
favor making more of the reactants. Now, I know it makes no sense to take reactants away in terms of industry product, but you know what? Your exams aren't to do with industry, so they're obviously going to do stuff to make more reactants or product. Okay, depends on how they're feeling. Pressure. Now, pressure is the one you're going to get to. In order for pressure to have an effect on equilibrium, there must be at least one gas particle present. There must be. If there are no gas particles pr present, then pressure does not play a role. Please get that, because it's another one they're going to try and trick you out in. Also, here you've got to remember, pressure is defined as the number of collisions per unit area. So if we have high pressure in a gas or in a situation, that means there's lots of collisions, okay? And if we do, so, so for example, if I increase the pressure on a gas, and there's a couple of ways I can do that. One of them is to decrease the volume, gas laws from grade 11. The other way is to actually add an inert gas into it, which won't take part in the reaction. But if I increase the pressure, and you guys know how this feels, this is definitely how you guys feel. Come exam time, you feel the pressure, and you'll do anything you can to try to get rid of that pressure. It's like stress, okay? Equilibrium is the same. If I increase the pressure, then it try, it's got to get rid of that pressure. The only way an equilibrium system can get rid of excess pressure is to create less molecules. Not, it's got nothing to do with the size of the molecules. We don't care how many atoms are in the molecules. It's just the number of particles. It's got to have less, okay? Now, I promise you, I know you don't believe me, but come January next year, if you are going to varsity and now you have this nice long break, you've finished exams mid to end November, you've now been on holiday for two months and you're sitting there going, oh, not enough pressure, not enough, st trust me, you're going to want some stress because you're not going to like the fact that you don't have a lot of stress, okay, because you're going to have been so used to it. Same thing with an equilibrium situation. If I decrease the pressure by removing some of the gas or by increasing the volume, the situation, the, the equilibrium, will adjust to make more gas particles so that we can increase the number of collisions per unit area, all right? So whenever we look at a equilibrium reaction, when you consider the question, say to yourselves, what have I done? So what change did we make? increased temperature, decreased pressure, whatever the case may be, then you go, in order to do the opposite of the change, so if I increased pressure, I must now decrease the pressure, so I've got to do the opposite, and how do I do that? By going to the side with the least number of molecules, or if I increase temperature, then I must find the reaction that's going to decrease the temperature, which means it must be the endothermic reaction, okay? First and foremost, you need to be able to identify what was changed and then manipulate the equation, that's the best way to put it, to do the opposite to what the change was, okay? So I promise you we're going to do lots of these. I've got lots of questions because today we're not actually going to do calculations. So even though I've got a whole bunch of questions from past papers, none of them have calculations and I've taken all the calculations out because they stand alone, which is also really nice. Yay. So if you don't quite get the calculation, you can get the other half of the question. Okay. I think, I know it's a little early, but I think we can take a break before I start the question, and then we can jump right yes, in sure. after the break. Yes, sure. Yeah. You're the teacher. <laughs> I have some power sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> well, guys, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your comments and your questions. Lovely comments for you, Tracy, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> um, they really missed you. <laughs> uh, oh. I'll give you. I'll give you during this break. I think they should come talk to my kids. My learners. This don't. is your second class, remember? I know, but my learners today. I told you they called me old, mean, and uncivilized. Oh no, you How rude! Right. You should bring the students here. I think next so. Week. Yeah. Right, guys. We'll see you after this break. Welcome back, guys. Now, stressing about next year as a matriculant, where you're going to stay, that's not a problem for us because you could win yourself uh, one year of free accommodation, KTC of South Point. All you need to do is to fill in your, your details on the entry form, and that's it. Voila, you're on the draw, and we could announce you as the winner for next year. So, guys, get entering right now. Tracy, I have a... Oh, okay. Let me, let me tell. Are you All awake? Right. Are no. You awake? 
Uh, all right. Now you should see me first lesson on a Wednesday. My kids. All right. Like Hello, Tracy. Hello. Yeah. Okay, That's more like Sorry. you know. <laughs> I've got I've got so many comments from the guys. Um, okay. tackling the, your challenge question. Different yes. answers, though. But later on, I'll, I'll give you all of them. Oh, good. So, so they're not all the same answer. They're not all the same. Oh yay! So I actually got. I was wondering <laughs> if it might be a little easy, but that's okay. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> guys, keep your, your answers coming yeah. on our Facebook page. Okay. Well, we can Let's I continue. Okay. Yeah? So, first question. We're now looking at this is taken from the Gauteng prelim paper of 2008. Okay, obviously paper two. Now it says, William wants to determine the equilibrium constant for the decomposition of calcium carbonate. He seals two, two grams of calcium carbonate in an evacuated one decimeter cubed metal flask. Guys, the only reason why they're using the word evacuated here, don't get too um, bent out of shape over it, is they're just telling you that the calcium carbonate is in a flask that doesn't have any other gas in it. Okay, they seal it and then they heat it because what they're doing is they're creating a gas. You can see they're creating carbon dioxide. So they want to make sure that what they get is just carbon dioxide. Okay, evacuated just means it's in a vacuum. All right, connects to a pressure pressure gates to the flask, the flask is placed in an oven and heated to a temperature of 800 degrees Celsius, at which equilibrium is reached, was reached according to the following equation. So we've got calcium carbonate becomes calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide and delta H is greater than zero. So first of all, before I even look at the rest of this, I go, well, that means that my forward reaction is endothermic and my reverse reaction is exothermic. That may or may not be important. What I do need to take note of is that they said this was at 800 degrees Celsius because if they change temperature, they change the KC value, which you did last week, okay? So you've got to be aware of that. Then they give you the graph for pressure versus time for the decomposition of calcium carbonate is shown. So we look at this and we go, it looks a little bit like a rate graph because it's quite steep at the beginning and then it t tapers off and starts to level out, okay? So this would be very similar to the type of thing we'd get for a rate graph. And the first thing they ask you is about rate. They go together. How does the rate of the reverse, very important word here, reaction change from T1 to T2. Now, what you need to recognize here is equilibrium can only be established when the reverse reaction rate and the forward reaction rate are the same. When we start the reaction, we don't have, rea we don't have products. We have reactants. We heat up the reactants, so the forward reaction is going to be a lot faster. Okay, so the forward reaction is fast. As we make products, they can react to make the reactants again, okay? So at the beginning of the reaction, your forward reaction will always be faster than your reverse reaction until the reverse reaction catches up because now there's enough stuff around it, okay? So when they ask how does the rate re um, the, how does the rate reaction change? So now, but remember, it says, how does the re rate of the reverse reaction change from T0 to T1? Well, it starts at zero, because at T0, okay, there is, there's no reactants. So if there's no reactants, then we can't have a reverse rate. So it starts at zero and gradually speeds up, okay? and gradually increases, better word. So they want to know that the reverse reaction gets faster. Now they say, hopefully we will okay with that, what is the reason for the horizontal line between T2 and T3? So now we look here and go, what's this? Well, if my pressure is remaining constant, the pressure is actually measuring how much gas we're creating. Pressure is the number of collisions per unit area. So if my pressure is remaining constant, then that means I must have the same number of collisions per unit area. If I have the same number of collisions, then I must have the same amount of gas. That means between T2 and T3, 
equilibrium has been reached. Okay? Be careful here. That's not even vaguely looking like an I. Equilibrium. I'm just remembering how to spell. We also realized my kids know I can't spell either. Has been reached. Please be careful here. Has been. There we go. You may not say here the reaction has stopped because the reaction hasn't stopped. It's not a one-way reaction, okay? We are not using up all the reactants. We are creating reactants because the reverse reaction happens, okay? The reaction appears to have stopped. So if I could actually look at it from a microscopic point of view, it would look like it has stopped, but it hasn't. But equilibrium has been reached. Okay, now it says, draw a sketch graph to show how the mass of calcium carbonate changes for the period T0 to T3. So, sketch graph. Have to have my axes, okay? This will be time, and it's in the same units as the time from this graph. They don't tell me what those units are, so you don't need to put them in. So we have time. And it was the mass of the calcium carbonate. So this is going to be mass. This would probably be in grams. Now we've got to say to ourselves, well, what's going to happen here is that we're going to actually start with a big mass because I put the calcium carbonate in. As I put the calcium carbonate in, I heat it up, and it's going to get used up. But at the beginning, because using up the calcium carbonate is the forward reaction, which is the faster part of the reaction, it's going to get used up quite quickly. As it's been used, not used up, it's just been used, we're also going to start making it, but then the forward reaction is going to slow down because the reverse reaction is going to catch up to it. So what's going to happen is it's going to do this and eventually go straight, okay? It will eventually go straight. This must end up being parallel. Be careful here. I cannot get it to cut the time axis. It cannot touch that axis at all because we're not using the calcium carbonate up. There will be calcium carbonate in the reaction vessel when we're finished, okay, when it reaches equilibrium. There has to be. If there's no calcium carbonate, then it hasn't reached equilibrium, okay? Very, very, very important. Then, during a power failure, we all know what those are, the temperature of the oven drops to 500 degrees. What effect on only... Right, increase, decrease, or stays the same does this decrease in temperature have? Now, guys, please don't go, oh, I don't know, and then leave it out. And don't tell your teachers I told you this. Guess if you really, really have to, you've got a one in three chance of getting it right. If you leave it blank, you have an absolute 100% chance of getting it wrong. It's like multiple choice. Okay, so the rate of the forward reaction, so now we decrease temperature. Temperature affects the rate the same whether it's in equilibrium or not. If I decrease temperature, I decrease rate, period. Okay? So if I decrease temperature, I decrease rate. Always, always, always. No there's never, that's never going to change. The next one is the concentration of the CO2. So now let's look over here. So there's my equation. All right, let's take um, this out for now. And they're asking me to look at the CO2. And now we said that the forward reaction is endothermic because delta H is greater than north. The reverse reaction is exothermic. By decreasing the temperature, it's like winter. Winter means we made it colder. The opposite to making it colder is to make it hot is to increase the temperature. The only way I can increase the temperature of this reaction is to favor the exothermic reaction. So the reaction, the, the reactants and the products will react with each other in such a way as to increase the temperature again and we shift the equilibrium. So we create a new equilibrium. And when that happens, I'm now gonna favor 
the reverse reaction, because the reverse reaction is exothermic. It's to try and increase the heat again. If I favor the reverse reaction, I'm going to use the calcium oxide and the carbon dioxide, which means the carbon dioxide concentration will decrease. Okay, so all the way there, so this will decrease. Oh, and now life gets fun, because now they ask what would happen to the value of the Kc. They've done this deliberately. Guys, if they had changed concentration or pressure, the Kc value will stay the same. The only thing that it can affect your equilibrium constant is temperature. Remember your Kc value, and I'm going to do the, answer, the explanation at the same time. Remember that Kc is the concentration of your products over, and this is just a memory guide, the concentration of your reactants. You, we've just decided that by decreasing the temperature, we are going to favor the reverse reaction. Okay, we're going to make more reactant. By favoring the reverse, reactant, reverse reaction, I'm increasing the amount of reactant I have. The reactant concentration is at the bottom. We have more reactants, okay, which is at the bottom of my KC. But... Now I'm telling you lies too, because some of you are busy going, hang on, wait, Tracy, hang on. My reactant is a solid. You said earlier solids don't have concentration. I was 100% correct there. If we look at this KC expression, okay, I'm not going to include the calcium carbonate, and I wouldn't include the calcium oxide either. The KC for this equation would be equal to the concentration of the CO2 alone. That's it. Because the reactants are solids. So if we've just decided that in 1.4.2 we've decreased the concentration of the CO2, that means your KC value is also going to decrease because you're favoring making reactants. So you have less product. Less product means less CO2. Less CO2 means your Kc value decreases. Okay, so just be careful there, because if I had described this in the exam as going, well, the concentration of the reactants increases, I would have got this wrong, because the concentration of my reactants doesn't increase. I just have more of it, but it's a solid. It can't increase. Okay? All righty. Let's do another one, because we still have time. Okay. okay. I'm pretty sure there's going to be lots of questions just now. Mm. Yes. Okay. The following equation represents a reversible reaction that has reached equilibrium at 470 degrees. By the way, the famous scientist whose name we're looking for had a part to play in the development of this, e this reaction, just by the way. <laughs> just, but it's not who you think it is. There we go, in terms of who it is, because I'm pretty sure some of you know the name of this reaction. So. This is nitrogen plus hydrogen gives us ammonia, delta H, less than zero. That means the forward reaction is exothermic. The reverse reaction is endothermic. A change was then made to the ammonia in the equilibrium mixture at T2. And the graph showing the effect of this change is drawn below. The graph is not drawn to scale. So we go, mm, we don't like these graphs. Yes, we do. We're okay. This is the amount of gas we have. The, this first part from T1 to T2, where all my lines are parallel, that's when the first equilibrium was established. Then something happens, and if we look at the graph, the ammonia does this, it goes straight, and then it spikes. Okay? And ammonia is the only thing that spikes. There's only one way I can spike the ammonia like that. I put ammonia in. So into the reaction vessel, I added more ammonia, okay, NH3. And that causes a change in a whole bunch of other things, okay? But till from T1 to T2, there's still a slope on my graphs, which means between T2 and T3, it, the reaction is trying to establish a new equilibrium, 
okay? So it's trying to adjust for the fact that I added more ammonia in. And because we added more ammonia in, the system actually has to refavor the reverse reaction. We actually need to now make more nitrogen and hydrogen, so it wants to use up the ammonia, okay? So first question, what is the meaning of the horizontal line between T1 and T2? I just did that. All right, I said to you, what is the meaning? It, is, it shows that equilibrium has been established, okay? The concentration of the gases remains constant. Equilibrium, the reaction is at equilibrium, okay? It's reached equilibrium. State the change that was made to the NH3 in the mixture at time T2. Well, we just did that too because I said, well, we look at it and we go, it spiked. The only way it's going to spike like that, and it's the only thing that spikes, is we added ammonia. We put more ammonia gas into it. Now, naturally, this is not the industrial process. This is the harbor process. This is not me trying to make more ammonia, okay, because it would be stupid to put ammonia in to then favor the reverse reaction if I want. It's just stupid. Okay, next one. Explain how the change mentioned in question 2.2 affected the concentration of the H2 and the N2 gases as shown in the graph. So if you look at your graph, what happens here is the hydrogen goes up a little bit for a while and so does the nitrogen, okay? The ammonia goes down. So we add in and then it goes down again. So what is actually happening here? And this is where your explanation goes comes in, and I'll write it down so that you guys can get an idea of what you would write, okay? So it, it wants you now to explain. So the first thing you're going to put in there, okay, is you're going to say that the concentration of the NH3 increased, okay? We're all happy the concentration increased. This means, okay, that the reverse reaction is not going to be favored because we want to use up, okay, we, so the reverse reaction is favored in order to use up the excess ammonia, okay? Why? Why? To use or to react with, but to use the excess ammonia, okay, which then means the concentration of the H2 and N2 will increase. Now remember, square brackets mean concentration, okay, so they will increase why? To establish a new equilibrium. Okay, equilibrium. Okay, so I've stated the change. What was my change? NH3 increased. As a result of the change, I have to use up what I put in the result of it will be an increase in the N2 and H2 because we need to establish a new equilibrium. Okay, so actually these questions really aren't so bad. Mm -hmm. I think it's time for another break. Yes, it is. And guess what? Today what? is Mpokha Tewe's birthday. Who's Happy watching? Birthday. It's her 18th birthday. Eight, 18 and you're watching mine? Well done. Yes. And here's, here's, here's a comment from uh, Mulukhadi uh, to Mpo. Um Mulukhat says, well, happy birthday, Mpo, and your gift is a very interesting physical science lesson. Equilibrium constant. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> that, okay, that's one way to do it. And happy birthday to everyone who's celebrating their birthday today, guys. We'll check you out after this break.
Welcome back, awesome guys. I've got your questions and your comments. <laughs> if you haven't liked our Facebook page, make sure that you jump on it right now. Facebook.com forward slash Land Extra or follow us on Twitter at Land Extra. K uh, are you ready for this? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm not sure. You know what I nearly said? Casey. I, I know. Because <laughs> I've got a question. It's not Casey. I've got a question here. Okay. On Casey. <laughs> Hit me. Um, Nzuluna Pai says, My question to you, Trace, is if I would increase or decrease my pressure, would that affect my KC value? No. Nothing affects KC value but temperature, okay? So no matter what we do here, only temperature will change the KC value. And even with this graph, if you look at it, now here I increased the amount of ammonia. If we actually had values on this graph and calculated the KC value again, I would get exactly the same answer as I do for this part of the graph, without, without doubt. And I know it doesn't look like that would happen, but remember, the ratio from the graph from this is, is 1 to 3 to 2. And if you look at the graph, I know it's not completely to scale, but you can see that the hydrogen goes up about three times more than the nitrogen does, because it's 3H2. And the ammonia goes down about half, about twice as much as the, the nitrogen goes up. So it's a 1 to 2 ratio. Okay, so even here, even though I physically put in more ammonia, okay, yes, I might have more ammonia in there physically when the new KC, when the new equilibrium is established, your KC value will be the same because the KC value is actually a ratio, it's a division, that's a ratio issue. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got another question from John yeah. John. Yes. This is for real. Um, John John says, what if the equation... Uh, was in gas, not in, a s in solid, what will happen to the KC value? Um, well, remember, we don't put solids in. So if I, it's difficult with this one because this is all gases, okay? With the one we did, the last question, we had a solid in it. So I don't want to do too many KC expression questions here, but we don't include solids or we give them a, a ratio of one because they, they don't have a concentration. So the, in terms of here, even if one of these was a solid, and then we create our new equilibrium, my KC value would still stay the same. It's not going to change. Okay. Yeah. All right, then another one from Tulufelo Joanne is, uh, when is the equi equilibrium reached? When it gets to, at this point, when it's parallel. Equilibrium is defined as being the point in the in the reaction where the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. So as quickly as I'm making products, I'm making reactants. So they get made at the same rate. And in fact, if we could pretend we had microscopic glasses and we could look at the molecules in the reaction, even though it looks like nothing's happening, we'd, we, and we could physically take a snapshot, count everything, take a snapshot, count everything, it will look like the concentration, well, the concentrations will remain constant, but there's still a reaction happening, though. Yeah. Okay. We're cool? Are we cool? Yes. Okay. So I, I'm going to do one more question, and then we're going to jump, because this, this is the last section, and then we're going to end. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to do one more question, and then we'll do the challenge. Cool. Then we'll see. Okay. So question three. Hydrogen iodide, I wish they wouldn't use words like this because I get tongue-tied on them. Hydrogen iodide is a colorless gas that reacts with oxygen to give water an iodine. With moist air, hydrogen iodide gives a mist or fumes of hydrochloric acid. That's not particularly nice. It is exceptionally soluble in water, giving hydroiodonic acid, okay? I love these words. Moving on. So 8 moles of hydrogen iodide is placed in an empty reaction vessel containing 2 moles of hydrogen and iodine. The reaction chamber is at 130 degrees and has a volume of 500. When an equilibrium is reached, there are 4 moles of hydrogen iodine left. Now, in terms of what we are doing today, that, a lot of that information actually isn't important because that information was there to calculate the KC value which we're not doing today, okay? So they tell you that iodine plus hydrogen gives me hydrogen iodide and delta H is greater than zero, so my forward reaction is endothermic, which means my reverse reaction is exothermic. If the temperature of the system is increased, explain what will happen to the concentration 
of the hydrogen iodide in terms of the Chatelier's principle. So, forward reaction is endothermic, reverse exothermic. They tell you that temperature is increased. That means it's like a summer's day. It gets nice and hot. What do we do on a summer's day? We put the air con on or the fan because we want to make it cold, which means an increase in temperature will favor the forward reaction. Okay? So if I'm now going to favor the forward reaction, that means I'm going to make more product. If I make more product then the concentration of the hydrogen iodide increases. And they ask you to explain this in terms of Le Chatelier's. So what they were looking for is, now this, the, look at these first few words. According, because you want to do it in terms of Le Chatelier, according to Le Chatelier, oh, look at that. We're using his principle. According to Le Chatelier, if the equal, so, and from here you now give me his principle. If the equilibrium is disturbed, the equilibrium will move in order to step to compensate for the change. That gives you one mark because now I've said in terms of Le Chatelier. So what was the disturbance? So if we increase the temperature, okay, the endothermic, now watch what I'm saying here, the endothermic forward reaction is favored why because we want to decrease the temperature which then means we will increase the concentration of the hydrogen iodide okay so we increase in the temperature in order to get rid of that excess heat we want to favor the, the forward reaction because it's endothermic and we get rid of the hydrogen iodide. Remember I said to you right at the beginning, please don't learn these as being, well, if I increase temperature, I favor forward or reverse. Increasing temperature favors the endothermic reaction, whichever one that is. Okay. Now we're going to put a little bit of a spanner in the works. If a catalyst is added, we haven't spoken about catalysts today yet, what will happen to the hydrogen iodide concentration? Please be careful here. A catalyst, and we use positive catalysts in our curriculum, increases the rate of a reaction without actually undergoing a permanent change. It doesn't take part. Definition increases the rate of a reaction. A catalyst will not affect the equilibrium. All it does is it allows us to get to equilibrium faster. So it'll do nothing to your concentration. So it will remain the same. The hydrogen iodide remains the same. And our explanation is what I just told you. A catalyst increases the rate. So a catalyst increases the rate of reaction, both forward and reverse, okay? but doesn't change the equilibrium position. In other words, equilibrium is established faster. Equilibrium will be established quicker, but that's it. It makes no difference to the position of the equilibrium. Has no effect whatsoever on that, okay? And then if the, pre ooh, here we go. If the pressure of the system is increased, what will happen to the concentration of hydrogen? Not the hydrogen iodide, okay? Make sure you read it. So let's go back here. Look at our equation. All right, we have... Now I just want to take some of my other scribblings away. Okay, so now we're looking at pressure. On this side of the reaction, I have two molecules. I don't care that they're two separate ones. I don't care that they're two different sizes, but we have two on this side of the reaction. I also have two. Oh, okay. So now I have the same number of particles on both sides. It doesn't matter what I do to pressure because they have the same number. So what that means for us now is pressure will have no effect on this equilibrium. 
at all because the number of particles on both sides are the same. If the number of particles were different, then pressure would be an issue, but they're not, they're the same, which then tells me that actually my hydrogen concentration will be the same. It's not going to change. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I do have another question, but maybe we should do the challenge one first. Let's do the challenge one. Do you have questions for me from, well, have I just gone too fast? Answers. Well, let's see if we've got answers, yes. Okay, answers uh, okay. to the challenge question. Yes. Okay, Young Fusto says the scientist is Edgar Allan Poe. No, that's uh, an English Ganyezi question. Vilaga says John Haining. No, and we're doing well. I haven't even heard of half of these. Most of the guys like uh, Fefe say it's Henry Louis Le Chatelier. Le Chatelier? Mm -hmm. Le Chatelier? Most of them. Le Chatelier, yes. Le, he's French. Okay. I should not do the French accent. Most then. of them, almost everyone says And that. they are, if I can figure out how to get rid of this, 100% correct. Okay, well done. Henry Lo Louis. <laughs> <laughs> Louis, and it was probably Henri, Henri, Louis, <laughs> Le Chatelier. I can barely speak English, I should not do accents. And he was around between, uh, he was born on the 8th of October, 1950, I mean 1950, 1850. So he would be, if he was still alive, 266 years, no, 166 years old, 165. My maths <coughs> is not doing well either, so I think I should just shut up. But he died in seven, on the 17th of September, 1936. He was a French, French chemist, all right? And I found out a whole bunch of famous things about him. Now, obviously, we chose him because we're doing Le Chatelier's principle, but he didn't actually do the principle on his own, which I didn't know. Him and his partner, Jasper Rossi, Rossi, did it together, okay? And he's most famous for that, but it's actually not all he did. Just to give you a little bit of um, background, he was born in Paris, and his father was a French materials engineer. He was born to a family of one sister and four brothers, so there were six of them. Poor mother, five boys. Anyway, and I found this quite interesting. He, he says he wrote a book with a little bit of stuff in it and he had a very regimented upbringing and so if some of you think that your lives are tough he wrote i was accustomed to very to a very strict discipline it was necessary to wake up on time to prepare for your duties and lessons to eat everything on your plate etc all my life i maintained respect for law and order order is one of the perfect forms of civilization I quite like that, okay? He attended a col uh, I'm not going to try some school in Paris. At the age of 19, he enrolled in the École Polytechnique, which is the same college his father went to. And in 1870, all the pupils like him were named second lieutenants, and they took part in the siege of Paris, part of the, the French Revolution, okay? Now, he did really well at his technical schooling, and he entered Ecole des Mines, I'm <laughs> assuming it's a mining college, I don't know, in 1871, so 21. He then married a girl called Genevieve Nicolas, who was actually the friend of the family and the sister of four fellow students. So he had four brothers-in-law who studied with him. I think I could get a little... Mm. Awkward. Anyway, they had seven children. Two girls, five boys, of which five went into scientific fields. So I think that's quite a legacy to have left behind. Now, he trained as an engineer, but chose to be a chemistry teacher. You go, Le Chatelier. I love it. He chose to teach chemistry. Um, he had a whole bunch of stuff. He was appointed head of general chemistry um, in 1887 in the technical schooling place he went to, I'm not even going to try and, and, and pronounce it. At the College de France, he, success, he succeeded Schozensberger as the chair of inorganic chemistry, which is imp impressive. He later taught at the Sorbonne University, where he replaced Henri Moissain, moving on. He tried four times to get into the, Academ the Academy of Science in France, didn't manage until 1907, and at the same year, he was elected to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, which is very important. 
Now, his best work was for this, but, and I found this interesting, he worked on the harbor process, but his attempt resulted in almost killing one of his assistants because mm. there was air in the component, in the, in the, um, Thing in the component in the chamber he was using, which he didn't know, and then he gave up. But Harbour actually accredits Le Chatelier with the beginnings of his work. And in fact, this is what Le Chatelier said, because he, after this whole debacle, decided I'm not doing this anymore. And so he said, I let the discovery of ammonia, ammonia synthesis, slip through my hands. It was the greatest blunder of my scientific career. I'm just going to keep going because I'm assuming somebody can hear me right now. I don't know. Anyway, can they? Yeah, can yes, you? okay, good. Oh, look, we, we, we love power. But, and I asked you about his awards. These were decorations he was given to. So he was first named Chevalier, which is Knight of Legion d'Honneur in 1887. Then he became an officier in 1908, uh, Commandeer, which is Knight Commander in 1919 and was finally awarded Grand Officier in May 1927, which means Knight Grand Officer. I think mm. it's, I, I'd imagine that's like being knighted. I think you should just do history. Do I, do I love the history. I, I, I get quite, my kids, I can tell you stories about Newton, but it's not appropriate for today. Um, I love the history of science. I love the history because I think it's important that they know that it didn't just drop out the sky. Mm. You know, sometimes we think, you know, somebody was like sneaking. Mm, of course. Going, of how course. can I make their life difficult? <laughs> and it's not like that. It is it's like, like yeah, well, it's you know, bad. he's dead anyway now, All so right, it's fine. Did, did you say you worked at Saipono? It sounds like it, no, it's, it's at Sorbonne <laughs> University. It, it, it sounds almost like Saipono, oh, I know. Okay. Sorbonne University, which is in <laughs> France. I, I can't speak English. How am I going to speak French? Uh, Half okay. these words I can't say, so I'm going to try not to butcher them. Yeah. All so right. one university. Okay, yeah. I've got this question from Aboy Dumelo okay. saying, um, how does the temperature affect KC? <sighs> That's quite a complicated one. Um, it changes the KC value, and when you look at a question, so if we're looking here, for example, if I change the temperature, and you've then got to look at what change in the temperature does to the equilibrium position. So if I change the temperature and it favors the forward reaction, then the Kc value will increase. If I change the temperature and it favors the reverse reaction, then the Kc value will decrease. Okay, so it's the only thing that will change the ratio that we get to when we reach equilibrium, but you've got to look at which way the, f the reaction gets favored. Yeah. Okay. All uh, right. Like Apart from 45 that, seconds. We've just you have great comments. Oh. Tracy is just the best. Um, Zulu saying, I enjoyed this uh, lesson. Thank you guys for helping us. Without you, we wouldn't have done it. That's Norezi saying, I don't know what I would have done without your mindset. Thank you guys for helping us. Thank You're you, welcome. Tracy. You're welcome. a great job. Thank you. What happened to the time? I talk too much. It's fine. I'm a teacher. What can I say? All right. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for watching our show. Don't forget to enter the Be A Bright Spark competition because it's closing on the 3rd of July and the winner will be announced live on Lend Extra Live on the 21st of July. So better enter right now. A big thank you goes to the Department of Basic Education for making sure that we have uh, this show for you guys. We love you and we'll always be with you guys. Learn more. Lend Extra. Peace.